Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to be back together with all of you again. Across the country, community colleges are underused resources and that's an incredibly unfortunate situation. Community colleges serve many vital functions, secondary education and career pathways without the financial burdens of four-year colleges. They offer flexibility in scheduling and pace, better school life balance, and importantly, community colleges offer a multitude of STEM education programs that are in demand by employers everywhere. They offer associate degrees and stackable credentials in STEM industries that are growing exponentially. Well, today we're gonna to explore the expansive roles that community colleges play in supporting the STEM workforce from leading practitioners from industry and post-secondary education. We'll learn about innovative practices community colleges are implementing to accelerate STEM workforce development in areas like employer and community college partnerships, pathways to universities, dual enrollment, and credentialing. Before we get started, if you're new to the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice, the SLECOP is a global network of STEM leaders from STEM-focused community initiatives around the world that learn and share with one another as a national organization focused on supporting stakeholders in STEM. SLECOP and STEM Connector are always exploring grant opportunities that provide resources for strong programs. And we're currently exploring a grant opportunity with the National Defense Education Program focused on supporting STEM learning in community colleges. We'll copy the link to this opportunity in the chat window below, and we would welcome collaborators on this opportunity. So please look for more information in a follow-up email. Please fill out, our, you know, follow that link and, and learn more, and please reach out to your point of contact at either organization for more details. Before we fully get started, I also want to point out, because it's been a while, that down at the bottom of your Zoom window, you should have a little button that says Q&A. Go ahead and click on that really quick if you haven't before, um, and you should see the ability to ask questions. What we'd really like you to do is, as questions come to you, even right now, even before our panelists have had an opportunity to speak, if you have any questions about this topic, go ahead and put them in there. More importantly, maybe, if you don't have a specific question yourself, still please keep an eye on that tool and scan through those questions because you should have the ability to vote up questions that resonate with you. It's very likely that we're not going to get to every question. So the questions that get the most votes are some of those that will be kind of most likely for us to, to answer. So please, if you see questions that resonate with you, uh, make sure to vote those up, ask your questions, and get them in early. By the same token, I asked you before uh, to open up that chat window and introduce yourself. If you haven't already, please do so. And keep that window open as well. We love it when you have side conversations and sort of talk about the things that are being discussed. Some of our panelists may join you in that room as well. So before we head into our panel discussion, I'd like to introduce Ted Wells from STEM Connector, who's co-presenting this programming with the SLE COP. Ted, how are you doing today? Oh, I think you're you. muted. Unmuted. There, uh, there was some yard work in the background. So uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, really great to be here today. Uh, and uh, such a fantastic group. I see a lot of folks, uh, some new names, uh, as well as some folks that I know quite well. So appreciate you joining us. Uh, this is a really an area where I'm extremely passionate. Uh, that as I've been working at STEM Connector now for 10 years. And it's just true more now than ever that uh, higher education is going to be a, a requirement for participation in the STEM economy. And But it's also clear that if we're going to broaden participation and expand access to all students, um, we have to provide high quality opportunities that are affordable and accessible. I think this last year has shown us that the future of work is probably not as far away as we'd once thought. And we need community colleges now more than ever. Uh, they provide critical support for vulnerable students and non-traditional learners, as well as continuing education for incumbent workers that's critical to meet employers' ever-changing needs. As we contemplate investments in human infrastructure, communities, colleges provide the STEM community with so many resources at all levels of education. So today's panel is a real treat. Uh, I think you're really going to enjoy them. Uh, some well-known names in this space. They live and breathe this philosophy. And... We are thrilled that you're here. Uh, if my organization, STEM Connector, is new to you, please um, come visit us at stemconnector.com to learn more. And also uh, check us out on your favorite social media platform. We have a great presence across uh, many. And subscribe to our daily newsletter, The STEM Daily. Um, and also feel free to send us stories uh, that you'd like us to share more broadly. 
Uh, join us for a future program. We're going to keep doing this. This is our second webinar together um, with STEM Learning Ecosystems uh, Community of Practice. And we are going to be doing uh, another one, I think, next month, we're hoping. Uh, we'll look for a date shortly, uh, but uh, we'll be focusing on early STEM investments. So uh, I think if there's anything that speaks to the breadth of our uh, coverage and interest in this space, uh, today's topic, as well as our next topic, uh, certainly speak to that. So with that, um, I will hand it back to you, Jeremy. But again, thank you to all for joining us and looking forward to a wonderful conversation with a talented group. Ted, thank you so much for joining us today and, and uh, for introducing that work. I, I know I'm really excited about that, that early investment piece. Uh, that's, that's where a lot of my work has been. But I'm also really excited about our panel today because, frankly, I don't know as much about community colleges, and I'm excited to learn with all of you. So back to our panel. We're excited to introduce all of our panelists today who are leaders in post-secondary education and industry. First up, Dr. Scott Rawls is the president of Wake Technical Community College in Raleigh, North Carolina. Dr. Rawls has also served as president of Northern Virginia Community College, president of the North Carolina Community College System, and president of Craven Community College. So Scott, you're the, you're the president of the largest post-secondary institution in North Carolina. How important is leadership at the top in supporting partnerships with industry and other stakeholders? Well, first, thanks for having me. And I, I think it's a vital, it's, it is vital, particularly for community colleges. Our, our driving force, I believe, is widely shared economic prosperity. So if you're talking about economic prosperity, you have to be talking about job opportunities, workforce development. There's a reason why we're focused on workforce and you can't get there without industry partnerships. Um, I like to say that community colleges like ours are really through colleges. We're not to colleges. What I mean by that is very few eighth graders in our community are growing up thinking right now that they're going to Wake Tech, but more of them will go come through us than any other institution in our region. Uh, almost 25% of all the high school graduates will come through us. And they're coming through us to get to where they're going, which is either a, a better job opportunity, typically in a very dynamic region like ours, or to the next place of a higher ed stop point, the university. So partnerships are key, industry partnerships, and then being part of that ecosystem within uh, a bigger ecosystem uh, of our community. Thank you, Dr. Rawls. Uh, next up, we have Beth Broom. Beth is the senior advisor to the provost for STEM strategy at the University of California, Davis. Beth leads the STEM, STEM strategies team whose work focuses on creating opportunities and advancing efforts to engage business, industry, and regional stakeholders in supporting equity-driven STEM initiatives across the university. Beth, UC Davis has been a leader in partnering with California community colleges and employers to create STEM community college pathways across a variety of disciplines. Can you talk a little bit about what the driving factors were in creating these partnerships and how students and employers are, are benefiting from those? Sure. So thank you for having me. Um, so in California, um, the community college system is very robust, uh, as is the UC system. And as the land grant university, UC Davis is very um, committed to equitable STEM education. So, so when I first arrived, I took a look at the complexity of the community college system and really found some fascinating uh, data, which is 50% um, tech, right now we're at 55% of students of color in this state start their higher ed career at a community college. And when you look at the national numbers, greater than 50% of all community college students who are currently enrolled are enrolled in a California community college. So the fastest way for us to really feed and drive this STEM diversity conversation, as well as providing industry uh, more STEM uh, leadership, um, and diverse candidates was to really partner with community colleges. In addition to that, when you go a little bit deeper, you find out that better than 50% of all STEM graduates at the University of California throughout our 10 school system um, are transfer students. And then I really wanted to focus on how you can get students to and through this very complex system, reducing time to transfer, time to degree, and student debt making sure that when they graduate, they have a career or a grad school placement commensurate with their degree. So we've, we've worked closely with industry and community colleges, all three of us at the table to design a system by which we can do that and nuance it for each of the STEM disciplines. 
You know, it, it's always been surprising to me, Beth, that that more universities aren't thinking about kind of specific placement in the region and what the, the needs of the region yeah. are. I hope we can dig a little more into that as we go on for, for the, the rest of our conversation today. I love that work. Uh, next up, we have Maria Reyes. Maria is the Dean of Industry and Public Service for Phoenix College and is the Chief Executive Officer for Nexus Consulting. Maria has over 25 years of experience in higher education, ranging from student and academic affairs to institutional development. Maria, you were recently awarded a grant through NSF's INCLUDES program to support Latinx representation through experiential learning and institutional intentionality. First of all, I, I love that statement, number one, because I love experiential learning, and number two, because I just like the phrase institutional intention. Intention, it's hard for me to say. It's beautiful. Intentionality, there you go. Intentionality. First, congratulations. Um, could you provide some background on this, on this program and, and its aims? Sure. Uh, first, thank you for uh, inviting me to join today. It's a pleasure to be with you in the, ex it's called the All Rise Alliance, the Accelerate Latinx Representation in STEM Education and Institutional Intentionality. Uh, capacity Building for Experiential Learning is our long title, and we're really, really excited about what we're going to do. I want to reference our our principal investigator, which is Caroline Van, Ing Caroline Van Ingen Dunn at Arizona State University. Uh, Phoenix College is proud to partner to accelerate what we have been doing in course-based undergraduate research experience for community college students, as well as work-based experience. And this program is really to expand and provide resources to institutions across six states through hub and networking that will help all of us provide work-based experience and experiential learning for students at these institutions. It's 26 community college and six states. So this work over five years should truly expand what we're able to do and provide to do that. Some of the things that will be included, faculty professional development, what is the institutional capacity building to serve Latinx students, there's a, you know, this whole aspect of uh, servingness and intentionality with the Hispanic serving institutions. Uh, Phoenix College is almost 60% Hispanic population with many first gen, many working students. How do we provide these opportunities to students when they have so many other competing aspects in their lives? That, as Beth points out, what's the complex systems that are preventing students to getting to and through? So happy to answer more questions. That's some brief uh, overview of what we're doing and thank you again. Thank you so much for joining us, Maria. And last but certainly not least, we have Cynthia Murphy-Ortega. Uh, Cynthia is a manager with the University Partnerships and Association Relations at Chevron Corporation. Her organization manages Chevron's relationships with universities and professional societies and institutes throughout the world. Cynthia, Chevron has been incredibly supportive of pathway programs through community colleges and continues to explore ways to increase representation of underrepresented populations in STEM fields. Can you talk a little bit about these partnerships and why they're important to Chevron and how they could benefit uh, the industry more broadly? It's a great question. And we really have passion around uh, building those future STEM professionals to fill the workforce needs. And that's in our sector, beyond our sector, in government, nonprofit, et cetera. And traditionally we have uh, from a talent acquisition uh, perspective, recruited folks, you know, when they're graduating and, and doing internships, but not really the front end and really not with the community colleges. So I'd say in the last six, seven years, uh, really have embraced that pathway and helping to smooth the pathway from a two-year institution into a four-year institution. And in doing so, we have uh, partnered with uh, a few institutions uh, across the US to build these very specific pathway programs. And yes, they include like a summer bridge program when you're transitioning from your community college into a four-year institution, uh, but it's more than that. It could be coaching, advising, mentoring, scholarships, engagement with industry. So it's just a critical pathway to increasing the number of uh, STEM professionals that'll be out there in the future workforce and really diversifying 
that, that workforce of the future. So I'm pleased to say that we're partners uh, in these programs, but even beyond those specific programs, we talk to all of our partners about the role of community colleges and if there's anything that we can do from a general support standpoint, speakers, engagement, talk about our careers. I myself am a chemical engineer and female Hispanic. I'm always happy to get out there and uh, tell my story. Cynthia, thank you uh, for joining us as well. All right, so I, I know I have a handful of questions that I'm hoping uh, to ask. So because I'm standing here, I'm going to. Uh, but before I ask those questions, if you haven't already started to explore that Q&A tool and put your questions in, make sure you're doing that. I do see a couple of questions are in there already. Uh, so you can go ahead and vote those up or add your own questions. We did warn our panelists, those of you who are here from the SLE COP, uh, we warned them that, that all of you really like very kind of specific, tangible, actionable things. Um, so go ahead and ask those questions. They're ready for those as well. All right, so I, I wanna start by talking a little bit about, about partnerships. So, so uh, many of you, all of you mentioned partnerships and the, the importance of partnerships. So what I'm curious about in, in your work is what are kind of the, the hallmarks of a good partnership? So I know that sometimes in our world, you know, we'll see a, um, an organization that has a, a really famous name or a person that has a really famous name and we might gravitate towards that person and maybe it'll be a great relationship and, and maybe it won't. So when you're looking for a partnership, what do you look for to ensure that it's gonna be fruitful for, for the people that, that you are doing your work for? Ted, you wanna kick us off? I'm sorry, John. Nope. I uh, typed weird things down. Scott, oh. <laughs> my fault. No problem. No problem. Um, you know, right next to you on my screen is, uh, is our colleague, John, and his face was staring at me with his beard and I uh, read the wrong name. <laughs> no problem. Uh, uh, remind me, the, so again, partnerships, the value of partnerships. Yes. Well, again, yeah, so for, what do you look for in a partner? Uh, uh, you look for people who re see the strategic value in your role and particularly our students. Um, and sometimes, you know, for a community college, I will say this about our partners, our industry partners are a good example. Our industry partners are vital to us. I mean, they, they are what hold us. Uh, we often talk about creating ladders uh, and, but they are the, they are the planks that hold the ladders together. Now the industries can be different in their viewpoint of us. For some, they like who we are and they like the thought of us, the, the fact that we are, um, you know, so inclusive and diverse and, but the best partners for us see the strategic value in us and particularly in our students to hire our students. And so, you know, I will say this about our apprenticeship programs. You know, we have some industry partners who will give us resources to support our apprenticeship programs, but the best partners are those who actually hire our students as apprenticeship partners. And so it's a different level of commitment and engagement. Um, I used to work closely with Amazon uh, when I was at Northern Virginia. And I remember talking to one of their senior executives who really spent a lot of time with us. Amazon has very strong community college partnerships. And I was kind of saying to them, you know, I really appreciate your engagement with community colleges. And she made a point to say to me, no, this is not something we're doing because it's an altruistic thing. This is because your students are so strategic to who we are. And that's why you're so strategic. And that's what you look for. You see, you look for partners, public school partners who see that, you know, the whole is bigger than the, the two individual parts. Our university partners, I'll be spending all day Monday with our great partners at the School of Engineering and NC State, you know, people who see the value in who you are and who your students are, and then how that makes what their role is even um, it's a strategic pathway for them to accomplish their goals and to, to have a bigger purpose. And, and so not all partners are created equal. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And so when you target a partner, when you find somebody uh, in your region that you just know would be kind of a, a, a perfect fit for your work, Maria, I, I'm wondering if you can share with us a little bit um, in that scenario, how you sell yourself, sell the, the idea of community college. So if you find somebody who you know would be a great fit, but maybe community colleges aren't on their radar, what's the conversation you have with them to, to get them there? Yeah, uh, when you talk about partnerships and a shout out to my partner, longstanding partner, Gabriela Gonzalez from Intel. 
who is on uh, in with us today is that we really look towards when we wanted to outreach to Latinas in STEM and talk to, to young Latinas. And we said we had to learn about each other. So I had to learn about Intel. Intel had to learn about community college. We had to see what were the parts that we could bring together, bringing our strengths and really understand, as Scott is saying, how that matched mission, we each taking our own role and, and providing resources to the communities that we were outreaching to would then benefit what we were each trying to achieve. So that really, we spent a lot of time getting to know each other, getting to understand our culture, our respective cultures, the vocabulary we use, Community colleges started adopting some of the Intel vocabulary. They started adopting some of ours. And that is truly, as Scott says, not all partnerships are created equal, but those are the ones that really bring the results that you're looking for. We've served more than 6,000 young Latinas in the, in the county by bringing and working together to bring them towards resources and building social capital and understanding that community colleges were a pathway to that future engineering or technical career. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, and Beth, from, a, um, uh, from your perspective at, at um, the, the California system, I, I'm sure you could think of a partner who's just been incredible for you. And whether you say who that partner is or not, that's up to you. But can you talk a little bit about what made, you know, if you think about that kind of Paragon partnership, what made that partnership the Paragon? So I can point to one immediately, Cynthia at Chevron, who is my founding corporate partner in my community college system. And also- and it's not the, just because she's here with us today. <laughs> no, but more importantly, the supplier of Girl Scout cookies for the last six years, which has been tremendous, right? Um, but really what you're looking at in a partner is a thought leader. You know, and when you wanna look at the health and vitality of the region from an economic standpoint, you want to make sure that when you're building a program like this, it's really based on a tradable sector job, which then leads to four additional job creations. So you have entry points for all levels of education and all levels of economic vitality. So you help people move from poverty and all the issues tangential to it by giving them a living wage sector job. So whether that would be a career coming out of higher ed or an entry level career, potentially something that aligns with the community college and a workforce need. You want a partner that's really gonna help you focus on that and then make sure that the contemporary nature of what's being offered in this rich theoretical classroom is offset by both internships, mentorships, research opportunities. So that when a student does go and launch what, and hopefully at the partner entity, they're not only going to be an immediate leader with immediate impact, but they're going to have very few uh, trials in reducing this to practice. Thank you so much, Beth. Now, Cynthia, I've, I have two questions for you. And, and one of them is probably the most critical question, the hardest question uh, that you're going to be asked today. I'm going to ask that first. Um, what is the best Girl Scout cookie flavor? And I will tell you <laughs> if you are right or wrong. Oh, it's a right or wrong. I love that. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, there, say, there's one right answer. Okay, one right answer. I think it is uh, Thin Mints. Thin Mints are a nice contender. I'm sorry, oh. but it is peanut butter patties, tagalongs, especially frozen, um, <laughs> are the best Girl Scout cookie. All right, so Ooh. now the easier question, <laughs> Cynthia. Um, all right, so you know Chevron is is a is a pretty um, high ranking organization. I'm sure you have hundreds if not thousands of universities and institutions that would love to work with Chevron and you can only pick some of them. So from the other direction, when people are trying to work with you and trying to work with Chevron, what is it that you're looking for in them? If you have you know, 75 community colleges come to you and say, we'd love a partnership and you don't have room for that many, what are you looking for and how do you make that, that decision? And you're spot on. We do get a lot of requests and we're open to a lot of requests. We're always willing to discuss ideas. And if we can't partner with you, can we connect you with somebody else, right? Make a connection uh, via you know, various um, uh, boards that we sit on, other companies, et cetera. So when we're looking at partnerships, you know, the key item is common objectives and interest. So Chevron has certain interests and objectives we're trying to achieve. And so does the partner organization. And where do they align? So when we first start a partnership, it's very typical. And 
I expect this. There's a laundry list of options, right? A menu of you could do this, you could do that, you could do this. And then we sit there and debate it. And, and Beth and I have known each other, Ted and I have known each other for a long time. I really roll up my sleeves and want to talk about it. I don't just check the box and, and off we go. Um, so over time, how I can tell a partnership is getting stronger, the requests that are coming to me or our organization are very tailored to meet those common interests. Uh, so that to me is a, is a telltale sign that we're making progress in developing that relationship, not just to ask for money or resources. It doesn't have to be money. It could be people, resources, thought leadership. Uh, another one I would say is um, you know, common metrics then as well. So we're trying to make progress. Uh, the days of just giving a check or showing up at something, you know, really don't occur anymore. People are very mindful on how we want to spend our money and time to think the biggest impact on students. And so we want to see how, what are those metrics we're going to track? How are we tracking against them? Maybe there's not a right or wrong answer to that. And, and maybe we're on a different path sometimes, but we are trying to make forward progress. And sometimes we do seed things for a few years to get them going. And then another organization or the organization itself uh, could take over that uh, funding. So those are a couple thoughts and we're always looking for creativity. So nothing, nothing in this world remains stationary. So our partnerships cannot remain stationary. So we're always looking for new ideas, uh, new um, people resources, uh, new thought leadership so that we can continue to uh, progress as well. Thank you, Symphony, the, and, and I, I do have, oh, go ahead, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna jump in and say one of the value propositions that Chevron brings to the table is they do have partnerships with some other R1 institutions that are similar but different than what we're doing here at Davis. And the opportunity for Cynthia to say, hey, meet these folks at Texas A&M, let's go down there and see what they're doing and, and how we can leverage your best practices with theirs to create a better uh, pathway for community college students for both institutions or you know, U of I, what they're doing. So Cynthia's ability to be a connector among those investments that she makes is really helpful for us in terms of shortening the learning curve and keeping costs down. No, uh, Cynthia, I love conversations where I have a plan and then I change my plan because um, I think those are, are the most interesting. And, and I do have one. So I just posted a, uh, a question to the audience. And if you're not reading the chat audience, I'll, I'll read it here as well. What metrics do you use when interacting with partners? What metrics are they looking for? Cynthia, I, you know, this is a thing that comes up, man, a lot in our world, in uh, K-12 world and in uh, higher ed world. Um, it comes up a lot. And, and I'll be honest, it seems like it seems like there aren't a ton of people out there who have a great answer. Um, we do a lot of talking in the STEM world about the importance of measurement, and then sometimes things aren't really aligned. I, I'm curious what, um, with the partners that you've worked with, if you could give us some examples of um, data or measurements that have been collected um, that have successfully helped you um, determine the effectiveness of, of your, your outlay and, and also kind of share that story with your, your, uh, your board. Well, absolutely. A, a big part of our investment, certainly in our organization that manages university and association partnerships in the collegiate level, talent acquisition is one of those, right? How many folks did we hire? However, I'm very cautious about that metric because that does not tell the whole story. Uh, there are much broader metrics that we would look at diversifying in, in many cases for our community college pathway programs like at Davis, the Avenue E program. We're trying to diversify the pipeline. So we're looking closely at the diversity of the candidates they're, they're attracting and then also more importantly, retaining and graduating. Getting into programs, getting into any institution, community college, a four-year university, and you don't cross the finish line, that is a huge loss for the, not only the individuals, but really the world. These are people who are gonna contribute and be the future uh, of our world. So it's critical that you do identify metrics that are appropriate for each partnership. So I, I resist trying to have the same metrics for each partnership uh, because we may be trying to achieve different objectives. But I, I'll say, I do not want talent acquisition to just be the sole metric on getting people into Chevron because we're really here to help the whole pipeline. And so you then have to have metrics that address the full pipeline. I think this is an important takeaway. Everyone who's listening today and, and frankly, uh, SLECOP team, 
I almost wonder, frankly, if this is a whole future conversation, um, you know, with uh, SLE COP and the STEM connector talking about the types of metrics that we could and should be collecting. Cynthia, thank you for that. Audience, we are going to go to your questions in just about two more minutes. So if you have any, please uh, make sure to get those in. And again, even if you don't have any questions, make sure to read the questions that are in there and vote for the ones that resonate the most to you. Um, I do want to talk a, a little bit more. Um, you know, we, we try to start off very positive. Partnerships are important. We know they're important, uh, but they're also not easy. So Scott, I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the challenges that you maybe have faced in creating and supporting partnerships. Where did things crumble or fall apart that people need to be aware of as they're planning their own um, uh, partnerships? I think the most um, fruitful industry college partnerships are those that maintain um, a long-term perspective and work throughout a period of time. Uh, the companies, the organizations where I've been in colleges that have been most successful are those that take that long-term perspective. They, they work through the employment cycles. The ones where they don't work as well is when uh, they're, they're moving based on their, their cycles. You know, when they, when they need you, they need you right then. They need you to start a program in five months. And then when their employment changes, you don't see them for five years. And that does not really pay off. You're just kind of constantly cycling. The best partnerships are those that are consistent and they maintain a consistent um, persistence about maintaining the partnership all along the way. You know, I, I think that when I've been in these roles, there is sometimes a, a tendency to want to um, form a partnership, at least to start with for a kind of a really short, finite period of time to sort of test the waters. But, but I think you're right. I think that it's really difficult to actually do something uh, that makes change without kind of a longer term consistency. And I, I think one last thing, too, is that the, the partnership does not culminate in the ribbon cutting. I mean, too, too often, sometimes it, it's about that photo op, that ribbon cutting, and then you move on to the next one. Those are examples of partnerships that are just kind of bouncing. And so, you know, the, the real work happens throughout a period of time and moves beyond what might be the initial photo op ribbon cutting of a, of a partnership. I think that's a really interesting point, Maria. I, I'm curious in your work, um, thinking about what Scott just said, if it doesn't end at the ribbon cutting, um, but we also know that that partnerships in general come to an end eventually. Um, when when does it come to an end? When what's a good target for um, you know considering it a, a successful partnership that now comes to a close? Well, I don't know if it comes to an end. It just morphs and changes to what is the next thing that we need to do, and that might be with other partners, as Cynthia and Beth talked about as well as we might connect you to other partners that are now going to take you to the next space or here's what you know my other partners doing how about if we connect you and that will help them you know collectively advance what they're doing i completely agree with scott you know that it has to be that matched mission it has to be consistent over time and if that is has run its course then there's someone else that can pick up the work mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So we are going to go to our audience now for some questions. Audience, I'm going to, I'll, I'll uh, try to remember to uh, send you a chat a little bit ahead of time to, to warn you that I'm coming to you. Uh, when you ask your question, two quick things, if you don't mind. Number one, if you have a specific person you're asking the question to, go ahead and say that. But if you don't, that's okay. You can just ask it in general. And number two, if you wouldn't mind for context for our panelists, sharing what sector you're from yourself. So if you could introduce yourself and your organization and what sector you're representing in this conversation today. Uh, first up, we have John McFarlane, um, who has, a, a, I think, an interesting question about incentives. John, are you there with us? I am. Would you uh, introduce yourself and go ahead and ask your question? You bet. John McFarlane, I'm Partnerships Coordinator for the STEM Action Center and part of the Idaho STEM ecosystem. Um, we're developing a program where we're going to offer scholarships for high school students that pursue STEM diplomas. And we're trying to figure out ways that we can work with community colleges in particular to incentivize those students to um, pursue that pathway. And I'm just wondering if the panelists have any idea, any ideas on, around what they are doing to attract those students to their institutions. 
Yeah, oh, I'd love to jump in. And uh, one of the aspects is really blurring the lines between the high school and the community colleges. So how can we get them into early classes while they're still in high school? Even short-term certificates, that's one of the incentives we've provided to our high schools. Co-branding, uh, come to this high school, work with this community college, get this short-term cert that will prepare you for this work right away so that if they have to work while they're in community college or at the university, they are employable at that le at certain levels. And so what can you do in the summers, the Saturdays, online classes while they're in high school to get them those certifications with our colleges before they've graduated from your institutions? If I could jump in, I might add just a couple of thoughts with, for our STEM students, they're typically our technology students um, as well as our, our students who are in our associate science or associate engineering programs, they're looking for also experience with us. That may not be something that they're used to getting or thinking about at a community college. So for our technology programs, we try to wrap around uh, apprenticeship around all of those programs or at least work-based learning where they can get credit for work. And then with our um, more traditional um, but would move on to an engineering school or, or graduate program in STEM. We have a unique program here called START, which is really about students being able to do research experience while in high school in an internship format. They apply to that. They get that experience on their resume. They're working with our faculty, but also faculty from the universities and from the science companies, the science ecosystem around us. And so that's been, a, I think, a very successful and innovative way for students who are in those um, more university-based STEM paths to have an opportunity at a community college that they might not expect otherwise. And that, that helps in the recruitment. Thank you, Scott and Maria. Um, so our next question comes from Kate uh, Polakinis. Kate, did I do it right? Are you there with us, Kate? All right, I'm going to assume that Kate has either stepped away or has um, uh, a microphone issue. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask her question for us, Kate, if you uh, end up coming, go ahead and jump in. So Kate's asking, I'd love to hear more about how community colleges are approaching the creation of career pathways. Are they using burning glass jobs EQ data or getting labor market data directly from regional employees? Are employers identifying high value credentials and are the pathways being tied to dual enrollment program? So a lot of questions here, but but primarily around how we're determining what these partnerships uh, uh, consist of in a in a pathway perspective. Um, Beth, Cynthia, I, I know that the the two of you are um, you know work on on you know career pathways specifically together. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you determine those pathways um, for the, the 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 system? Sure, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so from my perspective at UC Davis, we're a very comprehensive STEM university. So what I wanted to look at is what are our core strengths, right? What do we bring to the table that sets us apart from uh, the other UCs or CSUs? Then what are the emerging economic sectors within our region so we could increase the educational attainment and thereby help stimulate the economy? Um, and then what do the community colleges currently have and how do we reach out to industry to begin to fill their needs? So engineering and computer science was, was a really easy one um, because of where we sit. You know, we're down the street from Silicon Valley and, and the Bay Area and energy is an enormous industry here in California. And within the Chevron uh, Corporation, there's just about every STEM job you could imagine, um, including um, conservation environmental science, which is really important to us. So really just sitting down and talking with uh, the folks about what are your needs? How do we fill them? Put the articulation agreements in place with the community colleges and not stopping there, but looking at how do we actually work with community colleges so they're recruiting the students that might have the interest, have the academic ability, but need additional supports and wraparound services. So our pathways uh, are numerous at the community colleges. Um, and we do have a really great tool here in California we call ASSIST, where you can plug in and tells you everything you need to transfer. Um, but we intentionally 
hired a brand manager to come in and look at what we do with what we now call the Avenue programs, because there are so many pathways that was confusing the students. What we wanted to do is just put it out there and say, this is how you get to your career in X. And that's why we came up with Avenue. And then we brand the letter at the end of it signifies the discipline. Maria, what does that look like for, for your organization? Do you, do you uh, when, when you're thinking about pathways, um, are you more focused on the partner and making sure you're, you know, kind of filling roles that the partner needs? Are you thinking about the, the broader community um, and what roles are, are needed there? Are you thinking more nationally? Um, what do you consider when you're thinking about career pathways? Yeah, and the answer is yes to all of that, right? All of that comes into play and, and the economic development of the area, the economic development of what the broader state and national, and, and that means we're working with economic developers, the, the chambers, the, the All Rise program uh, grant that we're launching is really focused on the tech councils. You know, the structures that are within the economic drivers of these states are, are in some cases in place and already have the mechanisms to do what they need to do. How can we share resources and look at all of those? I, I can't remember the person's name, but the question of, you know, all of the uh, trend data of what's going on in the workforce, what speaking to our workforce partners and making sure our partners are being heard or that we're checking in, you know, you kind of have to back check as well and say, well, this is what we think we're saying. Is this what you're experiencing or vice versa? And, and then how can we share resources and, and not reinvent the wheel uh, to bring all those things together? Or how did you do it at this place? And so those are some of the questions I think that we ask. I'm, I'm a member of a 10 college network of or a district. And so we have that opportunity within our county, but sometimes we're talking to ourselves. And so we also check outside and go to those things. And so the answer is yes, bringing all those things together. Scott, can you talk a little bit about um, at a kind of specific level, um, what's a career pathway that you've worked on um, and, you know, how did it get started and how did it turn out? Well, let me, um, let me kind of give you an example of how we frame it. Uh, so we frame our college as our region's largest ladder college. You know, uh, we're the Research Triangle region. We're a region that's been built by higher ed. We were actually part of that strategy back in the 1950s when we had no base, mm -hmm. STEM-based economy. Now we're one of the leading STEM-based economies in the country and colleges like ours, just like Duke, uh, NC State and UNC have been a part of that. What makes us different, though, is this, while they have been magnets for folks coming to our region, we're really the ladder for folks to who have lived in this region to grow up into what are very tall and dynamic ladders. For us, the difference between ladders and, say, a degree pathway is what happens outside of the degree. The degree forms a basis for it, but it's also uh, how you can start before you actually get into a formal degree. Very well-developed dual enrollment programs. Just to get, let me use an example, biotech, life science for us, which is huge in research triangle. So we have early colleges where you can start dual enrollment programs in biopharma in early college or through dual enrollment. We have short-term training in a program called BioWork where you can get that and get an entry point into a biopharma manufacturer. You want that credit into our biopharma degree. We have a... a we have biotechnology degrees and biopharma, and then we have specific uh, apprenticeship opportunities, work-based learning opportunities that I missed be mentioned before to give experience, and then key university partners. If you're going into biopharma technology, a key university partner is ECU, which now provides courses on our campuses. Or in if you're going more advanced biotechnology, it might be at NC State. And then we share uh, what is the largest teaching factory uh, for biotech biotechnology on the East Coast, which is on the campus of North Carolina State. And the Wake Tech team is on one floor and the NC State team's on the other floor. And we partner together to figure out what additional um, skills training and other types of things you may need, whether you're a scientist, engineer, or you're biopharma tech. And that's evolved from this kind of joint uh, collaboration going back to the 1950s that has emerged to make our region now an ecosystem for, for STEM opportunity. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone, for answering that question. I know that it's a, a really, uh, you're, you're perhaps new to, to this collection of people. 
And pathways are, are an incredibly important part of the work of many, many, many of the ecosystems. Um, so just be forewarned, it wouldn't shock me if you end up with some, uh, some email questions uh, over the next couple of days. Um, all right, Maria Benson has a question that, that I'm hoping uh, she can ask, and I, I'd love for all four of you to do a kind of quick speed round answer of it, um, because I, I think that it's um, um, a critical one. Maria, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi, Maria. I can. Can you introduce yourself and your sector and ask your question? Hi, I'm Maria Bailey Benson. I am a faculty member at South Mountain Community College in Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, Maria Reyes. And um, I run STEM summer camps in, at South Mountain Community College. And my question was about um, how each of the colleges represented here today has um, really formulated their own STEM ecosystem. And they've answered some of my questions, but it'd be great to know what are some of your best practices and how you've developed your STEM ecosystems in terms of pre-college initiatives and relationships with, with um, industry partners. So this might be your actual, you know, kind of SLECOP STEM ecosystem, but it also might just be uh, your own internal ecosystem when you, you know, who are you bringing together? Um, you know, what are the, the roles and the voices that you want to make sure that you have uh, in, in order to, to make this work successful? Um, Beth, you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, I'll start with one sector that's very important to our economy, and that would be agriculture. So we... Uh, you know, work with uh, the Cooperative Extension, 4-H, a number of various boys and girls clubs, uh, the after school network throughout California to not only uh, host summer camps on campus, but to bring um, cutting edge opportunities to students wherever they're at throughout the Central Valley or the Northern part of the state so that they can begin to learn about all of the different pieces of STEM that are really uh, integral to getting food to the table. And that can be biopharma, that can be um, medical, that can be animal health, that can be plant and soil sciences, that can be technology, all of those types of things, right? You know, how do you produce a higher yield using less land and less water for crops? So we took a look at what is that ecosystem? And a lot of it was just picking up the phone and cold, cold calling and then leveraging existing uh, opportunities and relationships to try to bring to everyone that we could, um, all of the pertinent opportunity and information to get them excited and amplify their interest in trying to solve these grand challenges and problems. Thank you, Beth. Maria? So Maria, it's great to see you. And one of the aspects that uh, really became prevalent with COVID and where we've been is testing medical lab technology, histology, how are all those COVID tests running through the labs? And here in Phoenix, it's Sonora Quest Labs, which is doing some of the testing for the entire Western region of the United States. Had, re had an opportunity to, to visit the lab recently and just racks and racks of COVID tests and other types of tests. Histology, we have a histology, histotech program. You actually can start in histology without a, without a degree and right out of high school. So recently, so the ecosystem said, we can't fill these jobs. We can't wait for everyone to come out of these programs. So we contacted Phoenix Union High School. We brought the economic developer in from Phoenix, City of Phoenix. Who do we have that we can put right into these jobs? And then while they're working, have them start our program. There's a $5 an hour difference between a high school degree and having the degree in, in this program. So that's a whole ecosystem that says they have a shortage and a workforce need that is absolutely critical, especially in this global pandemic of what we're experiencing. How can we meet it today all the while increasing their, their relevance and their opportunity for advancement while they're working for you? And that's just one example of an ecosystem kind of coming together for today and tomorrow. Thank you, Maria. Cynthia, you know, I'm curious from a, from a corporate perspective, um, you're also developing and building an ecosystem to, to advance the philanthropic work of, of Chevron. Um, I imagine that some of the people that you look for and target in order to make that successful uh, are the same, but, but maybe some are different too. And I think most of the people here in this, this conversation today are, are on the education side. So as, a, as a, uh, the, the philanthropic arm of a major corporation, 
What are you looking for? What roles of community members are you seeking out in order to have a successful conversation and successfully change um, something uh, trajectory in, in, your, in your region? Well, certainly uh, one thing we haven't talked about today, we have a very strong program of uh, working with uh, community colleges with, in the areas that we operate. And so local business units uh, in New Orleans and Richmond, California and Los Angeles, Cal uh, California or Houston, Texas. So that to me is an important part of our ecosystem is investing and partnering with community colleges. And there we're kind of twofold. One, some of them are pipeline programs, right? The transition from middle school, high school into community college. Uh, that could be STEM fairs, um, could be tutoring programs. Uh, it could be technical summits. But then also we have some very unique programs in the community colleges uh, around uh, doing, uh, offering research opportunities uh, to students um, that are then preparing them uh, for you know, a next level degree, completing their degree there at the community college. So. I'm pretty excited to, and I, I have a list and it keeps growing of all the fantastic work that we are doing directly with the community colleges to help build the uh, STEM pipeline, uh, support the communities in which we live and operate, but then also the pathway programs for those who wanna go on and pursue their four-year um, engineering or computer science degree, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cynthia. All right, we only have time for a couple more questions, so we're gonna we're gonna go a little fast because there's a lot of really great questions here. Uh, next up is Brandy Dorsey. I believe I saw earlier that Brandy can't unmute, so I'm gonna ask her question for her. Um, Brandy asks, "Can you tell us the data on STEM diversity in the community colleges?" Now, the the four of you, I assume, maybe you know broadly, but but in your own um, universities. Um, what does it look like? And what are the DEI initiatives that you're having success with? Uh, we heard a little bit from Maria already earlier. Uh, what are the DEI uh, initiatives you're having success with to um, increase diversity and increase participation of minoritized students in your programs? Uh, Scott, can you, you talk to us first? Yes. Um, well, our diversity uh, as a community college, like most community colleges, we are more diverse than our community and our STEM programs, whether they be IT programs or our associate engineering programs are, uh, are more diverse than you'll find at uh, other, other forms of higher education uh, and um, typically more diverse than our actual community is. So that's kind of the role with community colleges, but we can always do more. And part of the big challenge is diversity in STEM. We all know that something that's happening here at our college is our county supports a particular effort called Wake Invest in Women. So we have a, uh, staff roles, we have scholarships, we have a, a countywide task force, which is really very focused about providing and creating more pathways and information and attraction for women in STEM, uh, particularly African American women, Latin Latino women, others into those STEM opportunities. So it's a particular county funded effort, not just a one time shot, but ongoing county effort that we have to try to hit that important issue for both us and for the employers we work with. Beth, I think I saw you on mute. What about, uh, what about with you? So one of the things that we do in all of our pathway programs is really look at a cohort based model that brings forth a sense of belonging, because in my opinion, belonging is what gets you to equity. And so while we do focus on particular numbers and percentages and such, the, the idea is that the belonging is the anchor that then leads to advancement um, that results from persistence and retention. Uh, we work closely with uh, our DEI office and we take a look at what are the needs of uh, the students or the, the student population from where we draw in California and how do we design initiatives to get those students to and through, making sure we clearly communicate, this is a long runway before you, you, you move the needle in a particular area. For instance, the uh, indigenous population in California is severely underrepresented in higher ed, as is the black population. Um, by the nature of being California, uh, our HSI numbers are good, but we've stopped looking at who's coming through the door, we're looking at who's leaving and who's leaving with a successful next step. 
So I think always keeping that front and center has really helped us to design these initiatives so that we are serving the student and not setting them up for failure. And I think our industry partners really appreciate that and uh, have been great, great partners in that area. Well, as always happens, our time has snuck away from us. We only have uh, about three minutes left, two and a half minutes left. Um, our panelists don't know what I'm about to offer, so I apologize, panelists. <laughs> uh, but what I am going to offer that they will do is that um, there are still a number of questions that we didn't have time to answer. Uh, we will submit those questions to our panelists um, and give them a little bit of time to, to if they're available to, to uh, just answer via email, um, you know, just a, a quick response to some of those questions. Uh, and we'll get those back out to all of you along with the, the notes from, from today's meeting. I do have one quick closing question for each of you. We like to end with something quick and practical. So I'm hoping we can do a, a little bit of a round robin. You've all been working in partnerships for a very, very long time. I am positive that you have had some massive catastrophes in addition to all of your successes. So if you could go back in time and talk to yourself when you first started working in partnerships, what and you could only give yourself one piece of advice, one lesson learned, what would that be? What's the most important thing that you didn't know at the beginning that you do know now? Um, Beth, why don't we start with you? Engineers are difficult. <laughs> They're very linear. And when you're designing something like this, it's messy. So I would approach it differently when I first started working with engineering teams. Could you, uh, you know, I shouldn't do this because we don't have time, but I'm really curious if you could boil that down a tiny bit more. So you're working with an engineer now, you know this. What do you do differently than when you're working with an educator? So I think educators have a better sense of the complexity of dealing with a student and why there are on and off ramps and what success is might not be reflected in a letter grade. And engineers tend to look at hard data and evidence, which is great. Um, but it's really hard to concretize or get an, a, a data point off of a student who's had to drop out because they're working three jobs to pay their parents' rent, right? So I would relook at how we approach success metrics and focus more on process instead of just let's do the end game, which is hires or completions. Thank you. Maria, what about you? One lesson. Put uh, more structure to the partnership at the beginning. These, as Beth points out, these are long, longitudinal things that we want to show success. But if if we don't ask for that structure that supports that longitudinal data, I'm the linear engineer, right? That's saying let's make sure we have that in place. Then we might think that things didn't go well. So put that structure and formality uh, framework that will support that in place earlier. Mm -hmm. Frameworks are so important. Cynthia, final final lesson. Well, I'm one of those chemical engineers that Beth is referring to, <laughs> but uh, I've, uh, I'm nonlinear and she knows that as well, but I can get quickly into my engineering uh, box. And I think that's what I would tell myself uh, 10, 15 years ago is don't come in kind of with the structure and the answer. Like I had an idea of what how we were going to partner and it was very different and it's because you listen you learn you understand the educational system better and the, and our partners also understand our business better and really the broader mm -hmm. sector so that would be my advice is you know be open-minded incredible creativity out there on how to best serve the students thank you cynthia and scott bring us home what's one lesson that we should all take away uh, mine's similar to cynthia uh, listen more talk less um you will demonstrate your value by hitting the target, not by immediately trying to prove your value. My grandma always told me you have two ears and one mouth. I never learned the <laughs> lesson, but, but that is what she always tried to say. Well, thank you, everyone. We're about out of time. So a huge thank you to our panelists today. Thanks to the great work from STEM Connector and the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice for organizing and hosting this event. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to visit STEM Connector's website at www.stemconnector.com and the SLECOP's website at stemecosystems.org. Don't forget to fill out the survey mentioned at the beginning of our time together. If you don't still have that, it'll be in the follow-up email. And please join us for our next webinar to discuss early investments in STEM. Learn more, learn more about why companies are choosing to invest in our earliest learners. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.